Hello, my name is Amber Young, I'm 16 years old, and today I'm going to talk to you about the big idea of momentum in science and my journey throughout medicine. So a little bit about myself. At a very young age, I've always had passion for learning science. I would read many different science texts relating to anything about the topic, including astronomy, earth science, and geology. But then I discovered that I enjoyed learning about the human body and the dynamics of life. So by the age of nine, I told my dad that I wanted to be a doctor. And I had a dream that became reality. And this is my story of creating momentum. So at a very young age, I became inspired to study neurology. And I became inspired after hearing Dr. Ben Carson's story and reading his book, Gifted Hands, which explained his rise from humble beginnings to becoming a world-renowned pediatric neurosurgeon. So at the age of 10, I began studying neurology, dissecting many different brains, sheep brains, pig brains, any mammalian brains that I could find, <laughs> to know its parts and functions. And I became fascinated with the topic of science. And my background includes a wide variety of STEM, including stem cell research, tissue engineering, bioinformatics, and drug discovery. By the age of 10, I began using stem cells, suffer neural cells that can dis differentiate into many different tissues and organs and repair them. And I began making these different, and culturing these different stem cells from neurons and from muscle tissues and human capillaries. Science completely fascinated me at a very young age. And with also a background in scientific research and world affairs, which have helped shape me into the more cognizant and aware person that I am today. For several years, I've traveled to the United Nations headquarters in New York City to meet with UN ambassadors from member countries, including Comoros, Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina, to discuss global health concerns, including access to health care and access to medication. Also on behalf of the World Health Organization, there are a set of eight UN Millennium Goals which are expected to be met by 2015. And these new goals of the new world includes eradicating poverty, access to drinkable water, access to women's rights and health care. These are the new goals of the new momentum in science and technology. And I'm so excited to be a part of this story and this momentum in science and technology. The scientific community needs more women. We need to change the culture for the way that science is viewed. Science is an open field of discovery and creation and understanding the ways that science can be applied on a global scale to, to change lives, to improve lives, and also to save many lives. There are many young women that need to become engaged and possibly consider a career in the field of science. It's an open field, and I have decided to take that path in my life towards medicine. So with a successful person, it's not only about your talent and your education. There are many traits and characteristics that lead to success, and I'll talk about some of them. Receptivity, be open to new approaches, to new ideas and perspectives, and open to new methods of learning. Receptivity allows you to learn. And I've always known that being receptive allows you to have access to more information and to grow even more for my personal growth and for my maturation in my field. And I've always known that if you have too much pride, you cannot learn. Resilience, being able to spring back and bounce back after a failure is very important because not everything is going to work out right perfectly on the first try. But it's not always about who gets it right the first time or who gets there the fastest. It's about after a stumble, a mistake you make, a roadblock, coming back and conquering for another try. That's the true champion. And that's what I've dedicated myself to. And it has been my own personal struggle with resilience because initially, I was a perfectionist. I thought everything had to be right, but then I had to accept the way human nature works. And it's not always about getting everything right. It's about working towards a goal and setting a clear agenda, making a plan and working towards that plan and staying focused and dedicated on it. And I've also been able to understand that each stumble leads up to the ultimate vision of success. So I've learned that mistakes aren't bad. They're just as good as when times work out well. Everything has a lesson in it. And that's what I've learned to accept with resilience. And resilience allows you to not quit when things get hard. Because it's always evident that you will run into trouble. But it's always about conquering, setting a plan, and going over those roadblocks. And I've set myself to that. And that has also increased my confidence that I can do anything. 
Double loop learning focus. Double loop learning focus involves learning at a deeper level. So when you have a problem, it's not about looking at the superficial surface areas of a problem or looking at the symptoms of an issue, but going to the root cause of a problem and asking yourself, how did this happen? How can we fix this and how can we avoid this in future situations? Surpassing your comfort limits are very important. I don't know how many times I've had to surpass my comfort limits to get to this point. It's not comfortable being a young woman in science. There's not many young women in science. However, going beyond these comfort limits have allowed me to grow personally, have increased my self-esteem and self-confidence to show me that I can go into any field that I want to pursue. And that route has seemed to be neurology. Character development is very important. Everyone wants a doctor that has high ethics and high leadership skills and is honest and sincere, but that's very important for any person. Character development is very important and should surpass your talent, your education, and your charisma, because that leads to success. It's not always the raw talent. Character is very important. Self-awareness. I understand that as a young person, we're finding ourselves, we're finding out what we want to do in life. However, it's fine to evaluate yourself now. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Your preferences, your dislikes? What can you improve in and how can you work towards that? And being honest with yourself helps to give a valid evaluation of where you need to grow. And that's what I've done. Being aware of myself and knowing who I am. Building partnerships. Networking is very important. Personally, that's the way that I've been able to maneuver through different research experiences is by not what I know, but also who I know. It's very important to surround yourself around successful people and to keep positive influences around you for motivation and to maintain a positive can-do attitude is crucial to being successful. So now I'm going to talk about one of my recent research projects, which involves using mice models to analyze the molecular mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease. This research has been performed at Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland, in the neuropathology department, along with my mentor, medical students, and postdoc students as well, targeting Alzheimer's disease and aiming to reverse neurodegeneration in the Alzheimer's disease brain. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia in the elderly that causes memory loss, forgetfulness, and disorientation of events in time. Currently, about 5.3 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease, and it is projected to reach about 13.5 million by 2025. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by the accumulation of protein aggregates, including amyloid plaques and tau tangles, that ultimately lead to brain atrophy, which causes brain shrinkage. The three main hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are the beta amyloid plaques, tau tangles, and brain atrophy. So a little bit more in depth about the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. The beta amyloid plaque is abnormal to the brain, and it develops from the parent protein known as APP, the amyloid precursor protein that is sliced in the brain and Alzheimer's disease at many different cleavages by different slicing enzymes, including base one. And these peptides of beta amyloid are released into the brain outside of neurons that clump and deposit of plaques and disrupts memory and learning centers of the brain. The next component of the Alzheimer's disease physiology, physiology are the neurofibrillary tau tangles. And these tau tangles develop inside of neurons that swells nerve terminals and disrupts memory as well. The clumps and tangles that develop in the brain ultimately leads to brain shrinkage and causes a decrease in the brain surface area. So the aim of my research is to design a mice model that can exhibit the amyloid and tau pathologies accurately to analyze the neuron loss that occurs in main regions of the brain that control learning and memory, which includes the cerebral cortex and hippocampus, and also targeting to understand the tau dosage, how the amount of tau protein, which is toxic in the brain, how does that impact the neuron capacity? And also, how does the risk of age, how does the at risk of age and how the mice ages over time, how does that affect the rate at which Alzheimer's disease progresses? And these mice models are also valid for drug validations and effectiveness as well. Animal models are crucial to demonstrating the neuropathologies of Alzheimer's disease. However, there have been gaps in clinical trials in humans which have been disappointing. 
These failures highlight the need to develop better model systems to exhibit the mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease. And a more robust model has been characterized, the MICE model. And this is the model that I have used for my research. So basically, in my mice model, I used tau mice. I induced a tau mutation into the mice so that as the mice aged, it could develop Alzheimer's disease. Then the tau mice were crossbred with the APP mice, which allowed both pathologies to be in the same brain. And this is a better way for us as researchers to understand and organize the data that is going on in Alzheimer's disease. So in the process, you can see how the mice is euthanized and the mice brain sections are also stained to visualize the plaques and tangles that occur at the molecular level. So equally important, working with animals are very valid, are very valuable in research. However, working with people are just as important to get a face-to-face -face interaction of the toll that the disease takes on the patient and also the caregivers. So I've worked with Parkinson's disease patients, multiple sclerosis patients, and also patients who've had mental disorders, including depression and schizophrenia. And the main not documents that I wrote down were patient interaction, how the patient interacted with myself, the team of medical students, the doctors, and the post-grad students. Were the patients irritable? Were the patients easy to work with? How did they react to us and our presence? And this was important to understand the emotional toll and personality changes that occurs during these neurodegenerative disorders. Health history. More than likely, if patients that develop neurodegenerative disorders, they have also suffered from previous health deficiencies. And I also note those just to understand the track of health issues that they've had throughout their lives. And lastly, I target treatment. For instance, in Parkinson's disease, we always treat those patients with levodopa, a drug that can treat and temporarily mitigate their symptoms of tremor and shakiness. However, every patient does not react the same to the treatment. Some patients react better to the treatment than others. But there is no cure for Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, but that is our goal. As a researcher, that's my mission, to find cures to different diseases to find therapeutic solutions to neurodegenerative disorders. That is my ultimate mission of my research. So my next steps involve developing an electrochemical biosensor for the early detection of cancer, specifically brain and breast cancer. And this is valuable to save lives and to increase the rate of survival due to cancer. And to also symbolize pre-cancer treatment staging earlier before the cancer spreads throughout the body before it's too late, when it reaches stage three or stage four. And the challenge with these biosensors are making them portable, affordable, and also reliable to the general, general public. And these biosensors function off of an antigen antibody tracking system so that as the bloodstream or sample of serum that passes through our antigen and antibody, whether it reacts or not, that tells us whether the person has the risk for cancer. My next steps also involve analyzing the changes in brain waves of Alzheimer's disease patients and understanding how their brain waves function under concentration, attention, memory, and sleep, and how that varies from a non-disease patient. And as a result of my background in neurological research, I am developing and launching my own nonprofit organization to continue my funded research. And within this program, my plan is to develop educational bio kits for high school students and educators to understand the basics of technology. And my experiences in medicine have been remarkable and eye-opening and encourages me to continue my path towards medicine. And I urge young people around the world to join the movement because this will not be a movement without you. And we are the future generational scientists. And so if you have any doubt, remember today, remember this talk, and remember the young woman that stood before you today that you can be a doctor too. Thank you.